Hallelujah. Well, are you saying amen or oh me? Amen. It's our choice, right? We can say so be it or we can talk about how bad it is. I found out something that mountains were made by words and mountains can be made either to move or they can be made bigger by words. <clears throat> Recently I was in a church and uh, we were preaching concerning the word of God and I believe uh, I have uh, in the last 22 years of traveling, it's, it's since 1986 I've been reading the Word of God and studying the Word of God and asking God to reveal it to me, um, I found out that God's Word is His vision for us. Uh, you know, in 1 Samuel, the third chapter, in the first verse, it says that the Word was precious in the days of Eli. There was no open vision. And I began to study that, and it goes on over into Proverbs 29, 18, where it says... Where there's no vision, the people perish. And I know we use that scripture a lot of times in um, church growth seminars, but I believe it's used out of context. Uh, I believe that when you hear uh, in that setting and they start talking about what's your five-year vision, what's your 10-year vision, what's your 15-year vision, I believe there's a difference in my desires and my plans than vision. And uh, if you go over into James, it says, go to now those that will say, I'm going to this city and I'm going to stay there a year and get gain. He said, for you know not what tomorrow brings. So your, your life is just a vapor. He said, what we should say is if the Lord wills, we'll do this or do that. So I used to go to those church growth seminars and my, with my dad and I'd come back and he would go, what'd you learn? I said, we got no chance. So we don't have a chance. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, they say I'm supposed to have a five-year vision, a 10-year vision, a 15-year vision. He said, well, what is your vision? I said, I don't have a five-minute vision. <laughs> but I realized that the vision, I began to do that. I, I, I looked that up in the other translation. It says where there is no redemptive revelation of God, the people are unrestrained. <coughs> Excuse me. Another one says where there is no revelation of God's will the people run wild so it's talking about I realize it's talking about the word of God is his vision and what we need to do is catch his vision we need to adapt our life to his vision and one thing we find out in his vision is there is a there is provision made for sickness and disease and we need to begin to see ourselves in light of his vision for us. Let me just share this with you precious people. He sees you healed now. Regardless of what's going on in your body, God already sees you healed. And really he's asking, why are you not healed? I've given you my vision for it. You know, over in, uh, oh Lord, let me think. Is it Habakkuk? He said, write the vision. Make it plain. Then he said, run with it. Amen. We need to grab that vision that God has for us concerning our health. We need to run with it. And we need to quit talking about how bad it is in our bodies. And we need to be talking about the vision of God. My God's got a vision for me. Praise God. Now, if I take a running spell, I'll be back. But I'm just about there. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I mean, it'd do all of us good to take a little running spell every now and then when we see God's vision for us. God wants to set you in a place of prominence. He wants to set you up in a place where you're well. You know, they said in Proverbs, said, what profit is it in my blood, if, uh, uh, Proverbs 30? And what profit is it in my, no, 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 so, well, anyway, one of them. I'm in the right church, I may be in the wrong pew. But he said, what profit is it in my blood if I go down to the pit? Can the dust praise you? Can it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. O Lord, be my helper. Praise God. And he stands there ready to help you right now. Help you out of what? Out of whatever's going on in your life. He's right there ready to help. There's no profit if I go down to the pit. That's one less that can proclaim his goodness. 
Now, I don't know where this is coming from. This is sermon number one. Is that all right? Hallelujah. But I'm telling you, precious people, God's got a vision for us. What we got to do is find out what his word says about us, write it down, and make it plain. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Father, to come and to open up your word and to show these precious people. By the way, Lord, they're your children. They're blood washed with the blood of your son, and they deserve the best. Father, I ask you to teach the word. Help me to teach it the best so that they can grab it, run with it, and it will elevate them to the place that your word says they can go. And we'll give you glory for that tonight in Jesus' name. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, uh, you know. Uh, I want to just clarify something that I said last night in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. You know, no man knows the deep things that we think except us. And so when I said that, I didn't want y'all to think that Uh, God don't know what you think. He knows what you think. But nobody really knows how I feel or how I believe except me. And what I have to do is I've learned this, that my faith is a, it is a personal, it's a personal interaction with God between me and God. And I have to come to the place to where I'm fully persuaded until I'm willing to stake my life on it. When it gets that real and that true to you, then you know something's going to happen. You don't have to worry about the works of faith. Once you get to that place, your works are going to come, and you're going to start talking, you see. This is is when people miss it is they, they get hands laid on, they go home, they never say another word. They don't ever go home and open their Bibles up and go, now, you said that when hands are laid upon me in the name of Jesus, The result of that is I am going to recover, be restored to health, be brought back to factory settings to the place that I was when I was created. And Lord, I'm not going to quit talking about that until it comes to pass. Until my body relents, until my body, until my body comes under subjection to the overpowering word of the living God, I'm not going to quit talking. People say, well, what if you die? The last words out of my mouth is, when he laid hands on me in the name of Jesus, I will recover. Well, what if you die? I'll step right out of this old body, right into that recovery, praise God. But what if we don't die? Why can't we just live here a few more years and have that going on in our bodies? Amen? Praise God. So, What I want you to do is, I encourage you to do is make your faith unshakable. Begin to do a background check on God. Turn your Bibles to Numbers 23, 19. Numbers 23, verse 19. You see, you're never going to develop an unshakable faith until you understand the one that promised. Numbers 23, 19 says this. Oh, the King James. Thank you so much. That's the real Bible. God is not a man that he should lie. How about that one? Well, then what's the truth? What God said? Or what someone else said? Amen? He said he's not a man that he should lie. So what does that make the Bible? The truth. Pastor Charles Cowan preached a sermon many, many years ago at Faith is a Victory, and I never forgot it, about, the, about natural fact versus supernatural truth. And he came out of the 14th chapter of Matthew talking about 5,000 men, and all they had was a Captain D's two-piece fish dinner. Well, the natural fact was this. There was not enough food. Anybody could see that, Right? But Jesus said, bring it to me. Well, you missed a chance to shout right there. Let me go over here and see if I can get these people to shout. He said, bring it to me. You got sickness in your body tonight? Bring it to me. And then 
Pastor Charles said. What he did was they took a natural fact, they brought it to the supernatural truth, and the supernatural truth not only changed the natural fact, but it changed it to the point that it was overflowing abundant. Well, why can't we do that with healing? Especially when we know that God is not a man that he should lie. So once you read the Bible, there's no b -b 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 buts about it. I have people come up to me all the time. They go, but, 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 you know, you, you get that. But, 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 but my mama died. My daddy died. But, 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 I, I'm sorry. I really am. I wish I'd have known it. I'd have come. I would have paid my respects. Is there anything I can do for you to help you through your pain and your sorrow? But the bottom line was it didn't change the word of God. Because it says God's not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should change his mind. So if he said it thousands of years ago, then he means it today. <laughs> Amen? So if he said whatever the word says 2,000 years ago, the same is the same, it's the same today. Why would he say Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? Well, if he healed yesterday then he's got to heal today or he's changed. Amen? What does it say in Malachi? I am God and I change not. Praise God. Well, if he meant it then and he doesn't change, then he's got to mean it now. So that's where I'm going to camp out. I'm going to camp out on Main Street that he means it now. Watch this. Has he not said it? Shall he not do it? <laughs> Glory to God. If he said it, he'll do it. And how many people know that what he said, he never forgot? Because he is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. So the word of God is the physical representation that we have in the earth today. From Genesis to the maps. Shall he not do it? Watch this. Has he spoken? Shall he not make it good? I tell him every day, Father, I know you're going to make good on what you said. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt you're going to make good. I don't care about it. I know you're going to make it good whatever you said. All right? Now, go with me to James... Uh, first chapter in the 17th verse. James, the first chapter in the 17th verse. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above. Well, then sickness and disease did not come down from above because it is not a good and a perfect gift, right? Right? Praise God. It said, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In other words, there's, another translation says, there's not even a hint of him turning from what he said. Glory to God. And so, when we see that. Now, go with me to Hebrews chapter 6. And uh, let's start at verse 13 there. Hebrews 6, verse 13. What are we doing? We're doing a background check. You know, I love that word history. You know what it means? His story. Amen? His story. Well, let's read a little bit about his story. Hebrews chapter 6. It says, For when God made promise to Abraham... Are y'all ready to shout? Because, honey, let me just tell you, we're entering shouting ground right now. We just went through the city limits right here. It says, when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. <laughs> Glory to God. 
In other words, God went through all the universe to try to find somebody that was more honest, had, had a higher integrity, higher character, and was one that was good for his word more than himself. He couldn't find it. He said, I'm just going to come back to you, Abraham, and I'm going to swear by the highest quality, the highest level of integrity. I swear by myself. Glory to God. Now, it says, saying, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater and an oath of confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Can we just dig right there just for a moment? If you've ever been in a court of law, the first thing they do when you go up to stand, you put your hand on the Bible, you raise your hand, I so solemnly swear to tell the truth, a whole truth and nothing but the truth. Well, from that moment on, those 12 jurors have to think this. Well, everything that comes out of his mouth is absolutely the truth. There is no debate as far as everything that comes out of that witness's mouth has to be the absolute truth. So when they go back to the jury room to reach a verdict, everything that was said was absolutely the truth. Amen? All right, let's go on. He said, men do that. But watch this. But wherein God, you ready to shout again? Here we go. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise. In other words, God is trying to help us with our faith, folks. You know, he's just not leaving you down here on an island by yourself and just say, do the best you can, just root hog or die. He's trying to get you to see that he's trying to help you wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto us the immutability of his counsel. In other words, the unchanging of his counsel. What he's trying to do is show you, listen, what I said I meant. What I meant I said. And what I said I'm going to do. God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. He even confirmed it with an oath. Folks, he's confirmed your healing with an oath. He said, not only will I heal you, I, I, I swear an oath. Glory to God. My body's got to be healed. No, but, 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 but my body's got to change. My body has to change now because he swore to it. He didn't just promise it, but he swore to it. Glory to God. It gets better. Look right here. That by these two immutable things, what's that? The promise and the oath. In which it was impossible. Absolutely impossible for God to lie. It's settled. Well, what if you don't get your healing? It won't be God's fault. Amen? It won't be God's fault. He promised it, and then he swore to it. Praise God. And one thing we know for sure from this verse, it is absolutely impossible for God to lie. And I remember I went through some things in my body. Everybody here has. And here's what I told the Lord. Lord, I want you to know that if I don't get this, a believer went under. I said, I'm standing here as a believer. I said, you know I'm believing. I know I'm believing. I said, and if this doesn't happen, a believer didn't get it. People, I had a man walk up to me after I said that one time. He said, how dare you talk to the Lord that way? I said, I was just telling him up based on his word. I said, if I don't get it, I said, because I know I'm believing. I know I am fully persuaded. I know that I know that I know that the word of God has to come to pass. It has no choice but to come to pass.
Hallelujah. It has no choice but to come to pass. Praise God. Praise God. Now, turn with me to Romans, the third chapter. I'm telling you, I don't know about you, but it don't take me long to get over depression. I turn down marvelous opportunities every day to be depressed. Because all I got to do is just start thinking about this. What have I got to be depressed about? Because I am blessed and highly favored of the Lord. I am blood soaked with the blood of the covenant. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look right here in the third chapter, verse 3. But what if some did not believe? What if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? You know what the next two words are? God forbid. God forbid. I love the rest of that verse. It says, let God be true. And every man a liar. When I first got saved and I read that, I, I, started in, I started in Matthew. I heard somebody say, when you get saved, you need to start in Matthew. So that's what I did. I had a Bible. My mother gave me a Bible when I was a heathen. I was a good heathen. When I got saved, the devil flew the flags at half mass for six months. <laughs> but when I got saved, I got saved. Hallelujah. And my mama would give me a Bible. And I tried to throw that Bible away 30 times, but it was like it had Velcro. <laughs> it would not leave my hand. I got saved, and the first thing I thought about, where's that Bible? And I dug it out of my drawer, and I wore the edges off of it. I started in Matthew. But when I got to this verse, it said, let God be a liar. I said, dear God, he's calling me a liar. <laughs> I said, I'm saved. I tried to quit lying. But you know what he's saying? He's saying this, if there's a lie told, it'll never be God. If there's a lie told, it won't be God. Can I say this to you folks? It ought to be as easy to get healed as it is to get saved. It really should, shouldn't it? <clears throat> it ought to be just as easy to get healed as it is saved. He said he cannot... That he said, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your sayings and you might overcome when you are judged. I said, you can judge my God all you want to, but I can tell you the result. He's going to overcome. Amen. You can judge him all you want to, but he's going to be, he's going to be justified. Amen? So then, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles back over to Luke, the fifth chapter. And let's just prove that out. Now, we've already talked about they took the man up on top of the roof and they let him down through the roof and then Jesus saw their faith and he said to them, your sins are forgiven. And then the religious people had a problem with that. The religious people said, who does he think he is having power to forgive sin? Who can forgive sin alone? Who can forgive sin but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts in verse 22 of Luke 5, he said to them, What reason ye in your heart, whether it is easier to say your sins be forgiven or to say rise up and walk? Did you see that, precious people? You know what Jesus is saying? It's just as easy to get healed as it is to get saved. But isn't it amazing when people come up to you, when you, try, you preach that to them and they'll go, well, but, 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 Brother Ken, we, sickness is a part of life. We, we, we've had sickness. There's hospitals everywhere. There's sickness everywhere. There's sicknesses, you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's a part of life. And I said, well, ma'am or, or sir, Jesus didn't say, the Bible doesn't support that. Turn with me in your Bible to so Matthew 16, verse 33, if you would. Are we doing Okay. 
Are you about ready to tell your body what to do instead of letting your body tell you what to do? Look in John 16, verse 33. Here's what Jesus, this is in red now, and I, I know the black's true, but the red trumps it all. He said, Matthew 16, 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. John 16, 33. Thank you, darling. John 16, 33. In this world, he said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Did you see that? He said, In the world you shall have tribulation. So then we see tribulation is a part of the world. Did you see that? It's a part of the world. But we live a spirit-filled life. <laughs> what did we say last night in, here, in, in Proverbs 4? Their life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. So it says that in the world you shall have tribulation, but... Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, when I first started reading the Bible, the first, my first thought, I'm just going to be honest with you guys, the first thought when I read this verse, I said, I believe that Jesus, I know you have, but that's good for you. You overcame the world, but what about me? I didn't realize that he overcame it for me. And that, I, this is what I tell people everywhere we go, I've learned if you'll do what Jesus did, you'll get the results he got. And so when we started doing what Jesus did, I started overcoming the world. So then we can't say things like what we've been trained all our life you know, it's kind of like when we were kids, we were trained, take care now, be careful, make sure you got clean underwear on, because if you get run over, <laughs> right? Be careful, be careful. You know, it's amazing. What does the word say? Be careful for nothing. I didn't say not respect it. But be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanks. There's faith. You can't, get out of, you can't get out of this without faith. With everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. I tell people everywhere I go, you don't thank somebody before they do something. Amen. When you're thanking God, you're thanking him because he's already done it. Then we, when we learn, I'm taking a little side trail here, we learn that as soon as hands are laid on us or we proclaim the word, healing begins right there. All right? So then he says, I've overcome the world. So we, we've been trained that sickness is a part of life. You know, I have people tell me all the time, well, Brother Ken, I'm in good health. Knock on wood. Knock on wood, you know. Bob, nothing's in the Bible says knock on wood. I'm in good health because he took my infirmities. He bore my sicknesses. Nobody wants me healed any more than God wants me healed. Nobody wants me healed any more than Jesus wants me healed or he would not have took them. He took them because he said, why would you bear what I've already took? Amen? He's saying, I did that so you won't have to bear it. I did it for you. Say this with me. I'm healed now. I'm healed now. I'm healed now. I'm healed now. 
<laughs> Glory to God. Right now, right here, right now, right here, right now, sickness, you've had your day. You may be a part of the world, but Jesus has already overcome the world. Therefore, I, you don't have to be a part of my life. I'm sorry about the people, unfortunately, that are dealing with these things in the world. But glory to God, Jesus said we're in the world, but we are not of the world. Praise God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Now, he said, which is easier? Well, then let me ask you this. If it's just as easy to get healed as it is to get saved, then it's just as easy to get your life on track. None of this is hard. Why do we make it hard? Well, why do we do that? I was in Brookings, South Dakota. They, a pastor asked me to come up. They had a minister's conference. And he said, would you come and and preach to the pastors on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Monday morning and Monday night. I said, sure. So I go to Brookings, and we're preaching. We preach Sunday morning. We preach Sunday night. There's probably 100 people there in that, in that building. There's probably 100 there, all pastors. And so on Monday morning, I was getting ready to do my session on Monday morning, and from over on this side, <clears throat> a man and a woman approached me. And the closer they got, <clears throat> excuse me, the closer they got, they began to weep. And it got to the place where this weeping was uncontrollable. When they got up there to me, I said, folks, uh, what, is, what is going on? Is there any, what can I do to help you? She said, well, we, we owe you an apology. I said, why, why would you possibly owe me an apology? I said, you don't know me. I don't even know you. Well, we've been listening to you preach for two days. And we've been talking bad about you all over the conference. I said, well, join the club. I said, I've been talked bad about by experts. I said, why have you been talking bad about me? Well, you just make the word so easy. And there's no way it can be that easy to receive from God as you tell us it is. Now, how are you going to go boldly to the throne of grace when you think what you're trying to do is so hard that you'll never succeed at it? When he's already made it available to you. It's not like when you ask God to do something for you that he has to call production. You know, you don't have to speak to him in the box and then the cook get on it. In other words, when Jesus said it's finished and then when he was raised up from the grave, healing was already manifested for you and all you got to learn to do is take the arm of your faith and reach into the treasure chest and just draw it out. Well, it's just, it's, it's just too easy. It is easy. Which is easier to say your sins be forgiven or to say rise up and walk? <laughs> Amen? Wh which is easier? Now, let's get back to the, the world, overcoming the world. Could you please go with me to John, the 17th chapter? Now, I'm going to say something to you tonight that I've been chewing on for a few months. I, I've never said this in a church. I'm going to say it tonight. I'm going to let y'all judge it. Is that all right? Because I know one thing about this group of people here. You know how to eat the hay and spit the sticks out. <clears throat> I, remember the <clears throat> I remember the first sermon I ever preached. I, I went to my dad in 1986 and I said, Dad, you're not going to believe this. I said, I feel like I'm called to preach. He said, okay, Sunday night you'll preach. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> I said, no, I said, I'm just telling you how I feel. He said, how you going to know, Ken? He said, Sunday night, we're going to find out. <laughs> I said, well, this is one conversation I wish I'd never got in right here. <laughs> Sunday night, June of 1986. Do you know what he told me? 
He said, let me tell you something before you get up there. There's nothing you can do that I can't fix. <laughs> Gave me a little confidence there. Because I told him, I said, well, you better get your fixer out. <laughs> but he told me that. He gave me confidence when I stood up. I said, well, I'm going to let her rip. <laughs> so I'm going to let this rip tonight, okay? Look in the 17th chapter of John. Now, as far as I know, reading this particular chapter, Jesus is talking to 12 men. About 12 men. And he's talking to, he's praying to God about the 12 that he chose. Let me give you, let me show you why, how I come to that conclusion. Look in verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those that you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So he's talking about 12 people, right? Let's go on down here, and let's, let's read verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. So let me ask you this before we go on. If these 12 were not of the world, then are we in the same spiritual condition they were? Actually, we may be better because I'm not sure that, born, I'm not sure salvation was totally, I know he breathed on them, and, but, but actually they didn't have what we have available to us because Jesus said in the seventh chapter of John, about the 37th verse, he said, uh, this he spake of the spirit whom they that believe on him should receive but the Spirit was not yet manifested because Jesus was not yet glorified. But they were not of the world. They were even, they were not of the world then. And, but we're separated from the world through the new birth. So we're really in better shape than they were. I know they took care of that when Jesus went and he led kept. I know. We, know, we all know that. All right, let's go look right here. I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they're not of the world even as I'm not of the world. I pray not that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil. Did you see that? So when I started seeing this and I started chewing on it, I said, wait a minute. Is there a place that I can get in the word of God that I can be elevated to a place to where evil is not a part of my life? Uh, but, 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 Brother Ken, trouble's been here all. I said, I've given them your word. Is there a place that we can get in the word, that we can get so deep in the word that it can bring us to the place to where Evil can't touch us. What did he mean by keep us from the evil? Let's go on a little bit. I'm getting a holy hush. What's this? They are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Well, let's stop right there a minute. Now, evil approached Jesus several times, didn't it? But it, did it ever touch him? Did it ever overcome him? He walked right by evil. He walked right through evil. It never touched him until he allowed it to touch him. Right? But the whole time he was here on earth, he was like MC Hammer. Can't touch this. Right? That's the best I can. That's the best move I can bust right there. <laughs> In other words, he walked right through the evil. He walked right through all of the attacks. He walked right through them. They were reaching for him, grabbing for him, grabbing for straws. Never overcame him one time, did they? Well, is he saying that 
I want my 12 to walk like that. Let's go on a little bit. What's this? He said, they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Was it sanctify them through thy truth? Thy word is truth. What does sanctify mean? Y'all know. It means to be set apart. So can the world set us apart? Can the word set us apart from evil? So, folks, we're not living at, we can, we can live at a little higher level. Now, thank God for healing. Thank God for prayer. And uh, thank God for God coming into our midst and, and, and bailing us out. But how about if he puts a hedge of protection around us where the evil can't get there? And we just walk in the word of God every day. We walk up and say, Father, I thank you that I'm not of the, I'm of the world, but I'm not in the world. Thy truth today, Father, will sanctify me. It's going to set me apart. And every scheme of Satan and his demons today, glory to God, they will not succeed against me. Amen. Go with me to Psalm 91. Now, let me say this. This is a goal. You understand this, right? Because if you don't tell people that, they'll put them in bondage and, and they'll go home and they'll be discouraged, you know, because they got trouble. Listen, uh, you know, this is a goal. Or let's put it this way. This is a level that God says we can attain. You know, you got to tell people that. You, gotta, you, you can't send them home in bondage. You know, you got to say this is a goal, but is a, a goal is available, right? All right, look in, look in Psalm 91 right here, and then we'll go to Mark 4, and it's getting about time to, Psalm 91. And so when I began to see this and I said, Lord, are you telling me that you've created a place for us that our lives can be that good? Because I said, Lord, I know you want me to live the good life. But I said, Lord, that's the good life on steroids right there. Amen? That's a good life. You can't even, your words can't articulate how good that life is. That you could live like that. All right, let's go over here and look at what Psalm 91 says about it. What's this now? What's worth verse 1? He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So if we're in a secret place, then sickness can't find us. Right? If I'm in a secret place, I remember when I was a kid, I used to watch this one cartoon. I loved it. And I can't remember the character, but all he would ever say was, which way did he go? Which way did he go? And I just believe that that's what we can get to the place to where Satan will say, which way did it go? Where did it go? Now, we're out here on the faith limb now. We're out here on the faith limb to the point, you know, when we were kids, you know, we defied tragedy. And they would go, I double dog dare you. Well, you had to do it then. And we'd get out on that limb away from the trunk, and that limb would start. Right? Well, come on. Come on, little girl. Come on out here, little girl. How we go? And then all of a sudden, you know, he got to really... Well, see, this is where we are now on the faith limb. So come on out here with me. It says that there's a secret place. Watch this. And here it is. 
I will say, dear God, you just can't get faith out of it. It's just, you just can't do it. You just can't get faith out of the word of God. I will say of the Lord. Well, let me share this with you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So then you're not going to say until you are absolutely sure. Or if you do say before being absolutely sure, you're going to quit in three days because it's not working for you. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. Now, Connie and I, we go up into eastern Kentucky. We've done a lot of work in eastern Kentucky over the 22 years, and that's probably been our more work there than any place in the United States. And we go to Paintsville, Kentucky, and they can somehow or another Kentucky has been inherited a huge herd of elk. And they have them up the top of this hill. We uh, the pastor takes us up to a restaurant on top of the hill, and we go through the elk refuge. Now these elk have been there so long, they know they're in a refuge. <laughs> They've lost all fear. Honey, you missed a chance to shout right there. They've lost all fear. They will walk right up to you. You can rub them on the nose because they look at you and go, can't touch this. <laughs> Amen? They know it. They're not dumb. Their instincts tell them there's no danger here. Is there a place for us that we can get into a refuge where there's no danger? That's a, a goal. It's a goal. Watch this. He's my fortress. <laughs> my fortress. He's my shield. He's my buckler. He's my defense. So, healing is wonderful, but wouldn't it be better if we never got sick? Is there a place where sickness and disease cannot touch us? <laughs> it's a goal. It's a, it's a goal. It's a place that's available. It's the top floor. I know we, I've been in hotels where you can go up so high, but after that, you got to have a key to get to the top floor. You got to have a key. Well, he's given us the keys to the kingdom. All right, let's go on a little farther. I'm going to close right here in this 91st. And that's the biggest lie a preacher will ever tell you, by the way. <laughs> Look right here. He will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings shall you trust. This is a goal. This is something... In Mark 4, I'm not going to go there, I'm going to quote it to you. In Mark 4, about verse 20, Jesus talking about those that are on the good ground. Man, when I read that the first time, Precious People, I, remember, I, I, I looked at it like, you remember back in the day when Sears Roebuck used to send, a, I'm telling y'all how old I am now, Sears Roebuck used to send a catalog out, but in the Sears catalog it had three qualities. Good, better, and best. But even as a kid, I could tell the difference between the good and the best. And as a kid, I would go, let's mark them other two out. I want the best. Why are we not like that in the Word of God? Why are we not like that in the Word of God? And 
He said this, and these are they that are sown on good ground who hear the word, receive it, and bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100. Good, better, and best. So I found out the 30 with God was a whole lot better than what I had without him. But then I got me a little taste of the 60. And I thought, hmm, hmm, this is good. And, I, and then I got real greedy about it. I said, wait a minute, let me see. If I can get to 30 and get to 60, why don't we move on into the 100? Amen. All right, let's go a little farther. Look right here in the fifth verse. Oh, wait, before you... Before you do that, hold your place right there. I'm, 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 I promise I'm going to be done by 15 after. I don't know what hour, but I'll be done at 15 <laughs> after. <laughs> Is it all right to have just a little bit of fun at church? All right, all right. Look with me in Psalm 50, 57, and let me, let me read this to you. It'll, it'll, it'll help you. Let's read verse 1. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. In the shadow of your wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. <laughs> this is a goal, precious people. In other words, when we can find the refuge... Get in the refuge. He didn't say I'm going to take the calamities out. He will one day, but not now. But he said that there's a place for you to get in the refuge until they pass right by you. They pass right by you. All right, let's go back to 91. Just thought I'd throw that one in. That was free of charge. Verse 5. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the COVID-19 that walks in the darkness, <laughs> nor for the COVID-19 that works in darkness. We respect it. We respect it nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. What's this? A thousand will fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not. <laughs> if it doesn't come near you, then it can't affect you. Now, this is how I read it. Now, I could be wrong. I'm, not, I'm from Kentucky. You got to understand, we don't get Saturday Night Live till Wednesday. We don't have CSI units in Kentucky because we all got the same DNA. <laughs> Everybody goes to jail. <laughs> Take them all. But this is how I read it. That it may fall at my side. It may fall at this side but it shall not come near me. Right. Sickness and disease of any kind may fall at my side, may fall at this hand, but there's a goal, the hundred. <laughs> All right, let's go on. I'm just about through. It says, but it will not come nigh you. Now look at verse 9. This is where we're going to, I wanted to get to. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation. You see, I wish I could tell you precious blood-washed children that I'm going to spend eternity with. I wish I could tell you that you don't have to do anything. You just go home and sit down. And when I, first, when I left Yellow Freight, they made us put warning signals on our trucks that when we backed up, it went beep, 
beep, beep, beep, right? And I wish I could tell you that all you had to do was go home, sit down on your couch, and just listen for the beep, beep. And that would be God back in the truck up to dump the whole load. But the Bible says that we need to do a little something. We got to find out where the habitation is. If you'll make the Lord, which is your refuge, your habitation. And I found out what the habitation was after a while. It's Genesis to Revelation. And if you'll abide in Genesis to Revelation, you get in that place, and if you'll stay there. And let me share this with you very quickly. We cannot continue to use our faith as an ace in the hole. We can't start using our faith. We're going to talk a little bit about proactive tomorrow. We can't use our faith, and we can't just sit around, and then when something comes, we dig the faith out. Faith is not like when I was a kid and, and we would go in, in buildings and uh, on every corner there'd be a, 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 a fire extinguisher, but they were wrapped up in a metal container with a glass and it said break in case of emergency. Well, faith is not that. You don't just break it when emergencies come. You get in the Word of God every single day and you talk to the God that it is absolutely impossible for Him to lie and you begin to proclaim, you begin to receive the things that He's promised you in His Word and you begin to walk in them and they become a part of your thinking, a part of your life. And then you get to the hundred. And then you get to the habitation. Here we go. The rest of 91, the rest of verse 9. If you'll make him your habitation, there'll be very little evil that'll get you. Every now and then, evil will touch you. I'm reading a tobacco patch translation. It says this, if you'll make him your habitation, there shall no, no, no evil befall you. This is a goal. The 30, 60, the 100. This is the goal. No evil will befall you. So we got work to do, folks. We got some work to do. And I, I had a, 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 a man, he was upset with me recently, and he told me, he said, all you faith preachers do is preach works. I said, you got me. I said, but it's not works to get saved. It's not works to stay saved. It's not works to get in a relationship with the Lord. I said, this is simply the works of faith that are motivated when it rises up in your heart and you begin to act like it's so. Let's close right here. No evil will befall you. Here we go. You ready? Are you ready to shout now? And no plague. No plague will come nigh your dwelling. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can't make that mean anything else. <laughs> we inhabit no evil, no plague. We get under the shadow and they pass right by. That's the goal. Something to work for. Amen? Amen? But right here, right now, we need to get healed first before we can get to that. Let's get our bodies healed and then let's move over into the hundred where we don't have to get our bodies healed anymore because our bodies stay healed because no plague can come down my dwelling. Right? People say, well, I'm ashamed because I need to be healed. Don't be ashamed. You got to go through the 30 and the 60 to get to the 100. Come on up here. Let's get to the 60. Let's get to the 60. And then once you get healed and God does exactly what he says he will do because he can't lie. 
He said, if you have hands laid on you in the name of Jesus, you shall recover. And from that point on, let's find the habitation. Amen. Woo, glory to God. Amen. 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 So can you hook up with me on that? Yes. This is the goal. Everybody in here, here's our goal. I'm going to get healed. I'm going to deal with sickness and disease through the word of God. I'm going to get my body healthy. And then I'm going to learn how to keep it healthy. Then I'm going to walk like a child of God. That God, the way he wants me to walk. And have what he wants me to have. And I'm going to live the rest of my life till Jesus comes back. Or I go by the way of the grave. I'm going to live it in divine health with divine blessings in my body. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's just close right there for tonight. Is that all right? I went five minutes too long. Please forgive me.